The emergency airlift that is about to get underway in the centre of Australia to save one of our cutest and most endangered animals. You're listening to Evenings with Chris Barth on ABC Radio Sydney, Canberra and New South Wales. Now, in the centre of Australia, a huge operation, a preparation for an emergency airlift of sorts is underway to try to save one of the nation's most endangered animals. It is a very cute 30 centimetre tall wallaby, a tiny little thing, a rufous hair wallaby it's called, or marla. Uh, there's a picture on the ABC Radio Sydney Facebook page if you want to have a look. They are seriously beautiful little animals. And here to tell you all about the marla and the rescue mission to save them is the Australian Wildlife Conservancy's Chief Executive Atticus Fleming. It's great to have you back in the studio. Thanks for coming in. Hi, Chris. Now, th- this is quite an operation and I want to get to that in a moment. But first of all, just give us a picture of a marla. What is it? We don't really see them your in the city. Intro, your introduction was perfect. It's it's one of the most beautiful of all the Australian animals. So it is a very small kangaroo, maybe 40 centimetres tall, maybe 1.2, one and a half kilos, rufous, soft rufous fur, almost shaggy. I mean, it's a very, very cute animal. But unfortunately, it's also just the right size for a meal for a feral cat. And that's why they're in trouble? Yeah, look, um, they once occupied almost half of the continent. So the early explorers saw a lot of marla as they as they rode through central and western Australia. But by 100 years ago, they'd, the population had crashed and the last wild population was in the Tanami Desert and it disappeared in 1991. So are there, what, any left? So there are six uh, semi-wild, semi-captive populations, if you like, insurance populations, And one of those is at Wataka or Kings Canyon in the Northern Territory. And that's the population we're moving this week to AWC's New Haven Wildlife Sanctuary. So what happened to that population to make you want to do what is going to be an emergency airlift? So um, the population at Wataka was protected from cats because it had a big fence around it. But unfortunately, a, a, a big wildfire went through and that removes all of the cover and just to, and in central Australia, when you get a fire, it can take years for the cover to come back. Mm. So they've been exposed to air, native predators, effectively, raptors, or eagles and so on. So nature's actually doing its thing. Yeah, except unfortunately when you've got a really small population, um, those impacts are exacerbated. So this population at Wataka is now too small to survive. Uh, we'll take it to New Haven where we've rapidly built a 150-hectare feral cat-free area. And that's the first stage in a much larger feral cat-free area at New Haven. So the, the future for the marla at New Haven should be very bright. So how far away from Wataka is New Haven? Uh, so it's about an hour's flight, which is the most relevant way I can put it, I guess, for the marla. So this will all happen tomorrow night. Uh, so we've got about a dozen ecologists, Australian Wildlife Conservancy ecologists and NT Parks and Wildlife staff. They'll be working all night, probably tomorrow night, to capture the marla at Wataka. And how many of them will they have to get a capture? About 20. Is that all that's left? So there's, the, as I said, there's the six populations around Australia. So there's about 400 marla on mainland Australia as we speak. Well, that's still appalling that there's only 400 left. And so what, there's 20 in this particular population. This po- how, do you, how do you pick them up? What do you do? We've got special, very soft-sided traps that um, we'll lay out 75 of those traps to, to catch our 20 marla. Uh, so basically the ecologists will work all night, capture the marla, they do a health check, all sorts of things, and then in daylight they'll be put on a, a Cessna and uh, flown from Wataka up to New Haven. And after the sun sets at New Haven, they'll be released into their new home, which is, as I said, 150 hectares Beautiful habitat for them. Uh, feral cat free. So our Walpuri Rangers have been working very hard over the last couple of weeks to make sure there are no cats and foxes in our new 150 hectare area. Um, and as I said, this is really the first step for these marla. We're building an, a 10,000 hectare feral cat free area at New Haven, uh, which is part of the planet's largest feral cat eradication. So while there'll be 20 marla heading up tomorrow and and toward the end of the week. Uh, We'll supplement that with some other marla from other populations. Within 12 months, they'll be out in the 10,000 hectare area. That area will then be expanded. 
ultimately we hope to have about 18,000 marla at New Haven. Have you done something like this before? Yes, yeah, so we've done this with other species, with bilbies, uh, with bridal nail tail wallabies and so on at places like Scotia, one of our properties in western New South Wales, and Mount Gibson in, in southwestern Australia. And these are the wildlife sanctuaries that the AWC runs? Yeah, so Australian Wildlife Conservancy, I guess, I mean, we do many things, but one of the things we do is build very large feral cat-free areas. And we know they work. We know if you put these really vulnerable native mammals into a cat-free environment, they'll breed like rabbits, fortunately. So they don't have a problem with being relocated? Oh, look, it's always risky Mm. when you're moving highly endangered animals to a new location. But there are ways, again, we've done close to 100 of these translocations now. So uh, with that kind of experience, we know what to expect and and, uh, we know what to do to give us the highest possible chance of making it work. I would imagine this is pretty risky because they're quite small animals and and they're obviously nocturnal if if you're trapping them at night. And so then you're whacking them on a Cessna. (laughs) I'm pretty sure none of them have ever been on a plane before. So, so, you know, these are the sort of animals that I would imagine could easily die of fright. How do you avoid that? So we we actually have a vet who will be part of this translocation and he'll give them any supplements they need to make sure the stress levels stay low. Uh, and obviously we keep them cool during the during the, the transport. They've got special air conditioning, all that sort of thing. And then we're releasing them after dusk. Mm. And when we first release them, they get a bit of supplementary food and water and everything else. So we do everything we can to make sure they settle in well to the new home. Because you have got another population of Marley you just mentioned on one of your other properties. Yeah. Ha- have you managed to increase that population at all? Yeah, so we've got a population at Scotia. I think we started with 20 or 30 and that's now 60. Uh, So those animals will head to New Haven over the next 12 months. Um, I mean, the other interesting thing to put this in context is the two closest relatives of the Marla were a hare wallaby that lived in New South Wales and is now extinct and another hare wallaby uh, which is known from only a single specimen. So this family is highly vulnerable and those other members of the family that are extinct help illustrate just how bad our extinction record is. I mean, there's four million odd cats now across the country killing millions of native animals every night. If we'd had these big feral predator-free areas hundred odd years ago, we could have stopped a lot of these extinctions. Well, it was, wasn't it? It was only a couple of weeks ago we were rated, wasn't it? Some the dubious distinction of being <laughs> yeah. very high up on the list of countries losing animals at a rate of knots. Yeah, yeah. You can do various analyses, but we certainly have the worst mammal extinction rate in the world. And, and the report you're talking about, I think, said we had the we were second in the world for loss of biodiversity in the last few decades. Yeah, which is not really an honour that we want. No, no, it's terrible. And, you know, cats are at the top of the list for why that happens. So how do you keep them out? What's involved in building a feral-proof area and how do you build an area as big as what you've constructed very quickly at New Haven that quickly? Um, Australian Wildlife Conservancy has some very practical people on staff who are able at the drop of a hat to put up a six-foot-high fence with a couple of electric wires and special skirts and overhangs. And uh, so we've built... This is nearly five kilometres of fence... Uh, in a very short period of time. Uh, But then, of course, the trick is to get any cats and foxes that are inside need to be taken out. And that's where the Walpuri Rangers who work with Australian Wildlife Conservancy have done such a great job in helping us do that. And these are the the Indigenous people in the area? These are the traditional owners of the country, the Walpuri and the the Laritja. Uh, So, I mean, they're a big part of this program and will be for years to come. I was reading, uh, Atticus Fleming is here by the way, he's the uh, Chief Executive of the Australian Wildlife Conservancy and we're talking about this airlift that's about to occur in the centre of Australia. I was reading that the Marla have particular significance for the traditional owners in that part of part of the country. Well, why does this tiny little animal mean something to them? Well, the the birthplace, if you like, the, the dreaming site for the Marla is on the southern boundary of New Haven. So as I understand it, the story is that the Marla were, were born at that site and some moved south toward Uluru and some moved north into the Tanami. So for this particular location, I think they're especially important. And I think it's, I mean, it's amazing to think that the Walpuri who are working with us now, the Walpuri and the, and the Laritja, are really helping to um, return this landscape to what it was a hundred or a couple of hundred years ago by bringing back these animals that have disappeared as a result of 
largely feral cats and foxes. How soon will you be able to try to breed up the population, assuming this airlift that starts tomorrow goes well? So the, this 150 hectares involves nearly 5 k's of fence. We've got to build 45 kilometres to enclose the first 10,000 hectares. So we're raising money to do that at the moment and building at the same time. We expect to finish that job and get all the cats and foxes out within the next 12 months so that by early 2019, the marla will be out into that larger area and we'll be putting other animals back, such as bilbies, numbats and so on, that have also disappeared from central Australia. Leslie's just texted in asking if we could spell marla because she's trying to Google it with lots of spellings, but no luck. So I'll get Atticus, you're the expert, you can spell it. <laughs> marla. I better get this right. M-A-L-A. But you can also Google Rufus Hare Wallaby, which is the other, uh, its other name. Yeah, its other name. Yeah. How can people help? Uh, look, um, at the moment, if you can make a donation to AWC, it's tax deductible. That helps enormously. Uh, I should say the federal government, the NT government, there's a lot of people backing this project. But uh, we do have volunteers who help from time to time. Um, so if you want to help build a fence in 40-odd degree heat through summer, um, you can also put your hand up. But, uh, you know, a donation, $50, $50 buys five pickets. Um, so even a small donation like that makes a really big difference. Atticus Fleming, uh, best of luck with this airlift and thank you so much for popping in to see us on the way. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Atticus Fleming there, uh, the Chief Executive of the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. And if you want to help, you just go to australianwildlife.org. That's where you go if you want to support the AWC in their endeavours.